there's always been difficulty of talking about class within the, the United States because of the power of, of liberal, liberalism and liberal thinking. Um, but I think in recent years, because of the popularity of identity-oriented approaches to thinking about inequality, it's become even more difficult to discuss uh, class in, in concrete terms. I want to refer back to uh, an essay which was published in 1962 um, by Harold Cruz, uh, who was a, a popular black intellectual uh, during the black power period. And he, um, he wrote an essay in 1962 called Revolutionary Nationalism and the Afro-American. And it appeared in Studies on the Left. And in this essay, he sketches, sketches out this idea that blacks constitute a domestic colony within the United States, right? And that idea, of course, would become the basis of a lot of black power thinking throughout the late 1960s. What's important about that piece is one moment where he begins to, to criticize his old Communist Party comrades. And he, he calls them American Marxists. He's really talking about people like Herbert Aptheker, who he really doesn't like. And he says that American Marxists uh, can only think about black people uh, when they're at the barricades. And what he means by that is that they can only see black people as a people without classes and without class interests. And I think that's still a problem, right? I think there's difficulty for people to think about blacks as a group with internal distinctions of interests, felt needs. Um, there's a tendency to collapse it all together and feel like we all sort of see the world the same way, think about it in the same way, we vote the same way with a few exceptions, and that's just not the case. Now, unfortunately for Cruz, he takes that, that powerful insight in a fairly conservative direction, right? He basically uses it as a jumping off point for making a case that black professionals and managers are the natural leaders of the population, right, of the black population. Um, and I, I don't quite agree with that. But I think the important takeaway point here is that the black population is not a political constituency. The black population is not a political constituency with some corporate or clear interests, but instead it's more helpful to think about this population as an ensemble of shifting and often contradictory constituencies and, and, and um, you know, interest groups. Once we take that perspective, it becomes easy to understand why so many people voted for Hillary Clinton. It becomes easy to understand why uh, Sanders has had a more difficult time as well in, in building support for uh, his campaign among black voters, even though there's been some slippage in, in important ways in different, different states. So on this question of why did black voters support uh, Clinton, part of this has to do with the connection to Obama, right? I mean, she's very much ran on this idea that she's extending or continuing the Obama uh, project. But it also has to do with the actual material and symbolic benefits that the Clintons have been able to, to deliver to certain black constituencies, right? And I mean that in a real concrete sense, right? When she's in South Carolina, she's talking to people who she's known since the early 1990s, right? These are not relationships that she's trying to develop during one election cycle, but she's basically been campaigning for a quarter of a century in places like South Carolina. So they're really deep and strong connections to people. And some of these folks can actually recall, um, you know, jobs, that they've seen, right? They, they can recall uh, the, at least the appearance of access to uh, the, president's, the presidency and, and um, the White House. And so I think um, the Clinton and Obama legacy has been felt differently by middle class blacks, right? Those who, who recall the 1990s with a more roseate uh, view. And I think it, you know, again, the people who are actually participate, and this is another thing we're missing, those folks who are actually voting in these primaries, right, tend to be folks who are going to vote for, um, for Clinton, right? They tend to be older and, um, you know, people who have this, again, nostalgia for the 1990s. The other thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that campaign, campaigning is not all about messaging, right? I've been hearing this a lot from people, and it frustrates me, right? The idea that somehow it's all about the ideas and not about the, the other mechanics that go along with delivering the vote, right, in a place like South Carolina or Louisiana or even Chicago for that matter. So it's much more than that, right? I mean, if it was only about messaging, how was Clinton able to win in South Carolina after, you know, her super predators comment was repeated over and over and over again in that state 
and other places and, you know, criticized by Black Lives Matter activists. And, you know, how will they continue to pull some black votes even after uh, Bill Clinton's extended defense of his 1994 crime bill, right? I think, you know, I don't think it's so tightly connected simply to the, the messaging, right? Um, but rather there are other things that are at, pl at, at play. So on this matter of Black Lives Matter and the super predators criticism, and this is a way for us to think about the complicated uh, internal politics of the black population. You know, um, a few weeks ago, uh, a local activist associated with the Black Lives Matter um, anti-racist politics, right? I'm, I'm trying to think of how to characterize. I don't want to name the organization that this person was a part of. But um, at any rate, this person gave a talk on campus, and she mentioned the, the super predators comment. And afterwards, I went up to try to engage in a conversation about where that came from, the super predators notion. And this is not a defense of Hillary Clinton, right, by any stretch. But what I was trying to impress upon, you know, this person who was probably about 15 years younger than me was that at that moment in the early 1990s or mid-90s, um, there were many black people who, who also were upset by the just outrageous levels of homicide in different parts of the country. In this city, I mean, you were like above a thousand homicides, mostly in South Central and, and East LA, right? In New York, over a thousand. In Chicago, over a thousand. I mean, even though we talk about there's an epidemic now, it's much lower um, than what existed in the early 1990s. And when she talked about the super predators comment, there was actually an empirical basis for that, right? I mean, right before that comment was made, you had the killing of an 11-year-old, um, you know, Robert Yummy Sandifer. His nickname was Yummy because he liked candy, right? He was killed by uh, two other teenagers. He had already committed, um, you know, numerous crimes, or at least had been accused of murder, arson, and armed robbery, and he was fleeing the, the police. And so members of his gang, the Black Disciples, executed him for fear that he might talk to the police and out some of them. And so this is where I think the super predators notion comes from, not just this case, but others like them, during that period of, you know, just Wild West type, um, you know, conditions in certain American cities. Now, with that said, the following year after the crime bill is passed, you get the Million Man March, which was all about, I mean, it's, you know, you think about that phrase, bring them, bring them to heel. How is that different from atonement, right, which was the main thrust of the Million Man March? It's dressed up in a different way. It's presented in a much more, um, you know, uh, as though it's coming from a more authentic place, but it still has essentially the same message, right? Let's try to solve these problems of deep inequality and segregation in cities um, and across the country, not through a return to New Deal type social spending, but rather through some sort of, of um, you know, cultural project of rehabilitation, atonement and repentance. So in addition to, um, you know, black congressional support, and some people supported the bill, you know, the, the crime bill for different reasons, I think this is the thing that's missing from so many conversations about black political life, and it's a major challenge to the development of the left going forward, you know, beyond the Sanders campaign and everything else that goes along with it. Um, I think we've, we've forgotten that context. At a much deeper level, there are many people who supported some other aspects of the Clinton project during the 1990s. You know, black, black politicians um, who supported things like Hope Six legislation, you know, which provided the beginnings of uh, the kind of, you know, revanchism we're seeing in cities. Demolition of public uh, housing and redevelopment of, you know, along mixed income lines. And this is something that, you know, again, has been supported by uh, black politicians, but also by, you know, ordinary black citizens who want to see solutions to the problems they're facing in different parts of the country. Now, the clearest and maybe the most powerful illustration of this for me was the post-Katrina context. I mean, Chicago is a great example as well, where you see this, this collusion of a multiracial uh, group of, of forces you know, developers, black politicians, black city council persons, the Clinton money, which is coming from the federal level, 
all aimed at you know, radical transformation of, of, uh, of cities and to the disadvantage of black working class people. So in New Orleans, I mean, after the Katrina disaster, you had this, this big push to demolish the big four, right? The last remaining big four uh, public housing complexes plus the Iberville. And you know, part of how they were able to succeed in this case was because the actual constituency was not allowed to return, right? So people weren't allowed to come back and to set up shop in their, their old units. They may have been allowed to take some of their, their belongings away, but they weren't allowed to move back in. So you have the removal of um, the actual potential opposition, you know, physical removal. And then in addition to that, you had uh, the mass firings of the most progressive elements of the black community in New Orleans, right? The mass firing of public employees and public teachers, right? You had 7,000, over 7,000 teachers and you know, school staff who were fired. So what happens in that context, right? Where you've gotten rid of not just the individuals, but the networks, the skill, the resources that they had at their disposal, right? They're swept aside. Who steps in? The city council, Ray Nagin, um, Alfonso Jackson, the head of HUD at that time. You know, all sorts of folks who we don't think of as, as powerful and important operators, but who were necessary in order to, to make this happen. You also had elements of the black business community uh, who, who thought that this would be a progressive step forward, right? Who stepped in to, to support um, these demolitions. And some may not have been uh, vocally for it, but they didn't oppose it either, right? They didn't try to mobilize support against it. And part of what I'm saying, and whenever I offer this critique of black uh, elected officials or, or other, other folks, one immediate response you get from people is that, well, you know, look, they're not, they're junior partners in all of this, right? And I'm not, I don't think that's the way we should go, right? I think that they actually play a role which uh, whites cannot play, right? They help to legitimate, they help to manage opposition in ways that whites can't. They help to authenticate certain kinds of projects um, in ways that, that uh, and authorize in ways that, that um, you know, powerful whites cannot. So that's something we need to, be, need to be mindful of. I've also heard, am I running out of time? Oh. <laughs> I didn't know I was going that long. All right, so. Um, I also think, right, so one of the things I've heard from people, uh, you know, in different corners has been that if only Sanders had, you know, spoke directly to black people, right, if only he had spoken the language of racial justice, if only he had embraced reparations as a, as a platform plank, um, and he's recently come out to say he would apologize or a president should apologize for, for slavery. Um, if only he had sort of taken this more direct you know, uh, means of appealing to black voters, he, he could have won, right, early on. He could have secured the, the nomination much earlier or at least been more successful in some of those early contests. Um, I can't say I agree with that, right? I don't think, again, it, it, again, it, it's a, it, it foregrounds this notion of messaging over everything else, right? I don't think it would have surmounted, again, those deep connections that uh, Hillary Clinton had, and, and just the, the get out the vote capacity that she has in certain states. I don't think it would have helped uh, so much. There's also other problems there that I want to mention in, by way of closing, right? Uh, a couple of other problems that I want to mention. Um, one is that I think, his, I think the perspective he's taking is a kind of anti-racist politics, right? I think the approach that he's been taking by foregrounding people's common concerns, you know, foregrounding, um, you know, social democratic policy is, is an anti-racist politics, even though there are a lot of people who disagree with me. Um, I heard Angela Davis recently on Democracy Now! and I was really disappointed by this, where she labels Sanders uh, an economic reductionist. And, you know, I'm disappointed in the sense that that's just become a ready epithet and a way of ending a conversation about the kinds of things that Sanders and other people have been uh, advocating, I think, and you all can disagree with me, of course, that what Sanders was doing early on was an, was an advance over the kind of pandering that we've seen from Clinton 
and other politicians who make promises to black people during the election cycle, but then pass crime bills and hope six and welfare to work legislation and all sorts of other things that do incredible harm to the same uh, folks. So I think that what, what Sanders has tried to do um, really to me harkens back to an approach that you know, reminds me of Eugene Debs, right, the socialist uh, and labor leader who um, took a different tact on this question of, of anti-racism and class struggle, right? So Debs wrote an article in 19, or a piece in 1903 uh, the Negro and the class struggle. And I just want to refer to one little part of it which pisses a lot of people off, but it's a good, good part to listen to, right? So at the close of this, this, uh, this statement, he says, you know, um, permit me to express the hope that the next convention may repeal the resolutions on the Negro question, right? Um, this is where people want to have this special message or special uh, agenda item related to blacks. He says the Negro does not need them, and they serve to increase rather than diminish the necessity for explanation. We, this, is the, this is the powerful passage and the one that gets people in trouble. We have nothing special to offer the Negro, and we cannot make separate appeals to all the races. So a lot of people I know despise that, that approach to socialism, right? They see that as just insensitive to race, doesn't pay attention to you know, different situated experiences. And I actually see it different, and so did black people living during that time period. People like A. Philip Randolph agreed with that perspective, one of the most important uh, black labor leaders of the, of the 20th century. He didn't see it as an, uh, an evasion of race. He saw it as an expression of the deepest possible solidarity uh, across race, right? Especially given how race was used in ethnicity to divide workers in really violent ways um, through the use of, of hiring scabs and you know, playing new, newcomer immigrants against more well-established groups. And so I think, I think it's the, I, I hear some of that in the Sanders campaign, right? How do we build you know, some sort of broad-based uh, politics without trying to find common ground with one another, right? I mean, shouldn't that be the basis? Not our differences, but what we have in common. I think that sort of approach takes much longer, you know, to try to build the coalition that might be needed or, or alliance that might be needed. I don't think it can be done in one election cycle. Uh, I think maybe an election cycle is not the place to actually undertake it, right? That it's something which has to happen in other places. And, you know, elections, as we've seen, particularly in respect to the Clinton approach, is really rooted in uh, patient-client dynamics and certain expectations about, um, you know, established constituencies and their spokespersons. And I think the Sanders approach speaks against that, right? It's actually going for a different view of how we should organize ourselves. Um, so I, I am inspired by it, but I think that there, there, there are problems on the horizon. And the last thing I'll say, um, is that maybe, maybe we'll see the emergence of a, a, you know, new left political forces in the country, which won't include all blacks, just like it won't include all whites or all Latinos, right? But it'll be comprised of people who have shared interests and maybe shared uh, conditions. So uh, I'll just stop there, and we can have some conversation about it. Okay, thanks so much.